If you run a transit agency, being able to cover as much of your operating costs as possible with passenger fares is very good. So this is gonna be the 10 transit services with the highest fare box recovery ratio, which I will define once we get into the video. And this is one that's gonna be fun to guess along with because it does take some unpredictable turns. Well, you'll see. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation, viewer suggested topics, always welcome. But this is a week where I just had my own burning question. Because yeah, this is another top 10 list, but as always, a top 10 list is just a watch mojo type Trojan horse for my urbanism propaganda and a chance for me to talk about whatever it is I'm interested in talking about in a given week. And this week it's really what does a fiscally healthy transit service look like and how important is it for transit to pay its own way when like highways don't. And I'll get into all this as we go through the list and hit some honorable and dishonorable mentions. Okay, let's do some definitions first. What we're measuring here is fare box recovery ratio, and I'm gonna use the number 11 service on this list, Wamata's Metro in DC, to illustrate. It's the proportion of operating expenses that are covered just by fares alone. So essentially, total fares divided by total operating expenses over whatever time frame you're looking at. And you can express it as fare revenue per passenger trip divided by operating expense per passenger trip. You get the same ratio and doing it on a per trip basis makes it a bit easier to compare the performance of different services in different cities. Why is the fare box recovery ratio important? Well, the higher it is, the less an agency has to depend on other revenue sources like selling ad space on vehicles or local or regional taxes, which can be a tough political lift. Fares are straightforward to understand, but on the expense side, the National Transit Database breaks operations into four categories. Vehicle operations, which is mostly driver and dispatch, wages and benefits, and fuel and other energy costs. Vehicle maintenance, so all the staff and supplies you need to keep the fleet running. Facility maintenance, which is what you're spending to keep stations and tracks or guideways in good repair and general administration, which is basically everything else you need to run a transit agency. So just to clarify what this list is, it isn't gonna be by city, and it's not even by transit agency. It's gonna be by service mode because I think doing it by mode helps to illustrate what goes into managing an operation where the service is widely used and the people who use it are willing to pay something close to the true cost of running it. Data source, it is the National Transit Database as usual, 2019 edition because all the data after that is still too wonky. This time I am digging into the operating expenses table though, and I'll link these data sources down in the description. Cutoff threshold, there are a lot of small scale services that have very high fare box recovery ratios, but I don't want to talk about weird outliers, so I'm going with 20 million unlinked passenger trips as a cutoff, which will get you a pretty good selection of medium and large city transit services. Okay, this ends up being an interesting and thought provoking list, in my opinion, so let's get into it. Number 10 is the San Diego MTS light rail. Oh, sorry, I guess they call it a trolley, despite it pretty obviously not being a trolley. I actually rode this bad boy to the Mexican border right when I started this channel. I think it was actually the day I hit 100 subscribers, and then I spent like four months traveling around our neighboring country to the south. Good memories. Anyway, surprise entry on this list. It is the only light rail system that makes an appearance, which will make sense as we go through the next nine. Number nine is the Chicago Transit Authority heavy rail, basically what we think of as the L. So everything number nine and higher is gonna have a recovery rate of at least 50%. Is that a good number? Is 100% a good number? It's kind of a philosophical question. Here's another question. Is the fact that fares are the same for everyone regressive? If I'm a high income person, taking the train is a super bargain, but if I'm struggling, paying fare is a hardship. I know there are agencies that do try to address this in different ways, but just food for thought. Number eight is the MTA Long Island Railroad. I'm calling this commuter rail because that's how it's designated in the MTD. You can call it regional rail if you want, I don't care. Okay, so we've already got light rail, heavy rail, and regional rail represented on this list, and you can kind of see the direction this is going. 
Rail is energy efficient, so you save on fuel. And remember, driver salaries and benefits are usually the biggest operating expense item. And trains let you spread those expenses across way, way more passengers. Number seven is New Jersey Transit's regional rail. Honorable mention to New Jersey Transit's bus service, which has the highest fare box recovery ratio of any bus service on my list of candidates. Anyway, what you'll notice is that these regional rail services have much higher operating expense per passenger. The distances are longer, so there's more energy used and more track to maintain. And the trains usually have multiple staff on board checking fares and whatnot, meaning that to maintain that high recovery ratio, the average fare paid is quite a bit higher than a heavy rail or a light rail service. Number six is SEPTA's heavy rail service in Philadelphia. SEPTA's commuter rail, street running rail, and bus services all meet the ridership threshold too, so it makes for kind of an interesting comparison and really drives home the relative efficiency of rail once you build it. Number five is Metro North commuter rail. It is interesting to see all three of the New York area regional rail services on this list, so let's do another side by side. Metro North is the most expensive to operate on a per passenger basis, and here's how the expense categories break out. Just interesting. In any case, Metro North does compensate for this with high enough fares to come out on top when it comes to fare box recovery ratio, but they're all kind of in the same 50 to 60% range. Number four is the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority's commuter rail operating out of Boston. This one's actually interesting because it's the only one on the list that's classified as purchased transportation, which means MBTA actually contracts operations out to a private company, in this case Keolis, which took over operations in July of 2014. Everything else on this list, and most major urban fixed route services in the US for that matter, are directly operated by the agency itself. Okay, number three is the MTA New York City subway. So let the suspense regarding the top two begin. I would have thought this would be a slam dunk to be the leader in fare box recovery since it runs the longest trains with pretty much the highest frequencies and spans of service in the US. So you'd think it has the highest passenger to driver ratio of anything on this list. And it has by far the highest overall ridership, which helps you spread out all the fixed administrative costs. But there are two services that beat the New York subways 70%. So maybe the big lesson of this list is that Fairbox recovery ratio is possibly more a function of fare policy than it is of ridership. Okay, in a minute I'm going to get to honorables and dishonorables and the mystery top two. But first, brief reminder to do all the things that make the algo happy to make sure my propaganda makes its way to an ever wider selection of potential victims. Connect in all the usual places and consider joining the Patreon to support continued production of Wednesday fun. Okay, important to point out that none of the services on this list actually turns a profit just on operating costs and I haven't even talked about capital costs at all. Do you want a public service to turn a profit? Philosophical question. In any case, I'm going to give you the top two for the scenario where I lower the ridership threshold to 10 million. And this gets you Caltrain, which gets 75 cents in fares for every dollar spent on operating. And it gets you the number one, the Puerto Rico Highway and Transportation Authority Publico system, which I still don't even want to try to explain, but it does make me want to go back to PR and it does run at a whopping 97% recovery rate. Okay, dishonorable mention, which I use kind of jokingly, but there is one major transit service in the US that has a 0.00 fare box recovery and has for a very long time. And that's the Staten Island Ferry operated by the New York City DOT. It is a unique service, but it is also kind of a case study in the rationale behind fareless transit services. It's $138 million in operating expenses divided by like 25 million trips. So you're kind of giving away $5.50 in value for free to every passenger, not even counting capital costs. And the vehicles are crazy expensive. The terminals take up a bunch of extremely prime real estate. I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time researching it because it kind of calls for its own video, but I did ask Bard what it thinks. 
Bard says, it's a giveaway to Staten Islanders as compensation for not being connected to the subway system. It's a giveaway to the tourism industry. It's an economic development giveaway to Staten Island. And it's a political relations giveaway to keep Staten Islanders from doing what exactly? They make up like 5% of the city's population. Eh, I don't trust Bard anyway. Let's keep it moving. Number two is Bay Area Rapid Transit. Always a weird one. Is it heavy rail or regional rail? NTD says heavy rail, but it does have fares and operating costs that are somewhere in between, so I do understand why people argue the point. It does surprise me to see this ahead of the New York City subway, but BART does run 10 car trains and they do have a distance-based fare, unlike MTA's heavy rail. And number one is the MBTA's heavy rail, which is differentiated from the MBTA light rail, which I think is essentially the green line. They're both the T, but they do operate differently. This is another one where it's interesting to compare the different modes from a single agency. You can kind of see how the fare box recovery ratio scales with the capacity of the trains or buses. Heavy rail recovers more operating expense than light rail. Bus rapid transit recovers more than conventional bus. Eh, Boston and Philly. So similar, yet so, so different. And that is all I've got. Thanks for joining today, and thanks to the patrons for continuing to make this seem like a semi-valuable use of my time. The city visits will keep coming. I'll be in Portland and Seattle later this month. If you're in Seattle and you want to meet up, uh, keep your eyes peeled, and I'll probably put something up on the community tab on my channel. Anyway, keep the great topic suggestions coming. I'll be back with a new installment next week, and I'll see you then.